Woundwort clambered out into the honeycomb, now dimly lit down the shaft by the daylight from outside. He had never felt so tired in his life. He saw Vervain and Thunder staring at him uncertainly. He sat back on his haunches and tried to clean his face with his front paws. Well, Flaley won't give us any more trouble, he said. You better get in there and finish him off, Vervain, since uh, he won't come out. You're asking me to fight him, sir? asked Vervain. Just take him on for a moment, will you? answered Woundwort. I want to start them getting this wall down in a few other places. Then I'll be back. And Vervain now knew that the impossible had happened. The general had come off the worst. Basically, what he was saying was, cover up for me and don't let the others know. What in Frith's name happens now, thought Vervain. The plain truth is that Flaley has had the best of us all along, ever since he first met him in Ephrafa. The sooner we're back to Ephrafa, I think the better. But he met Woundwort's pale stare. He hesitated a moment and then climbed the earth pile. Woundwort limped across to the two runs halfway down the eastern wall, which Groundsel had been told to get open. Both were now clear at their entrances, and the diggers were out of sight in the tunnels. As he approached, Groundsel backed down the further tunnel, and began cleaning his claws against a projecting root. Well, how are you getting on? asked Woodward. Well, this runs open, sir, said Groundsel, but the other will take a bit longer, I'm afraid. It's heavily blocked. One's enough, said Woodward, as long as they can come down. We can bring them in and start getting that end wall down. He was about to go up the run himself when he found Vervain beside him. For a moment, he thought that he was going to say that he had killed Flaley. But a second glance showed him otherwise. Um, I think I've got some dirt in my eye, sir, said Vervain. I'll just uh, clean it out, then I'll go have another, another go at him. And without a word, Woundwort went back to the far end of the honeycomb. Vervain followed. You coward, said Woundwort in his ear. If my authority goes, where will yours be in half a day? Aren't you already the most hated officer in Ephrafa? That rabbit has to be killed. And once more he climbed on the earth pile, and then he stopped. Vervain and Thistle, raising their heads to peer past him from behind, saw why. Flaley had made his way up the run, and was now crouched immediately below. Blood had matted the great thatch of fur on his head in one ear, half severed, hung down beside his face. His breathing was slow and heavy. You'll find it much harder to push me back from here, General, he said. And with a sort of weary, dull surprise, Woundwort realized that he was afraid. He did not want to attack Flaley again. He knew with certainty that he was not up to the match. And who was, he thought? Who could do it? No, they would have to get in by some other means, and everyone would find out why. Flaley, he said, We've just unblocked another run out here. I can bring in enough rabbits to pull this wall down in four places, so why don't you just come out? Flaley's reply, when it came, was low and gasping, but perfectly clear. My chief rabbit has told me to defend this run, and until he says otherwise, here I shall stay. His chief rabbit? said Vervain, staring. It had never occurred to Woundward or any of his officers that Flaley was not the chief rabbit of his warren. Yet what he said carried immediate conviction. He was speaking the truth, and if he were not the chief rabbit, then somewhere close by there must be another stronger rabbit who was, a stronger rabbit than Flaley. Where was he? What was he doing at this moment? Woundward had become aware that Thistle was no longer behind him. Where's that young fellow gone? he said to Vervain. Uh, he seems to have slipped away, sir, answered Vervain. You should have stopped him, said Woodward. Fetch him back here. But it was Groundsel who returned to him a few minutes later. I'm sorry, sir, he said. Thistle's gone up the open run. I, I thought you'd sent him, or I would have asked him what he was up to. Uh, one or two of my rabbits seem to have gone with him. I don't know what for, I'm sure. I'll give them what for, said Woodward. Come with me. And he now knew what they would need to have to do. Every rabbit he had brought must be sent underground to dig, and every blocked gap in the wall must be opened. As for Flaley, he could simply be left where he was, and the less he said about him, the better. There must be no more fighting in the narrow runs, and when the terrible chief rabbit finally appeared, he would have to be pulled down in the open from all sides at once. He turned to recross the burrow. 
but remained where he was, staring. For in the faint patch of light below him, below the ragged hole in the roof, a rabbit was standing. No African, a rabbit completely unknown to the general. He was very small, and he looked tensely about him, wide-eyed as a kitten above ground for the first time, as though by no means sure what he might be or where he might be. As Woundwort watched, the rabbit raised a trembling forepaw and passed it across his face, and for a moment some old flickering, here-and-gone feeling stirred in the general's memory. The smell of wet cabbage leaves in a cottage garden, the sense of some easy-going, kindly place, long forgotten and lost. Who the devil is that? asked Woundwort. Um, it must be the rabbit that's been lying there, sir, answered Groundsel. The rabbit we thought was dead. Oh, is that it? said Woundward. Well, he's just about your size, isn't he, Vervain? That's one of them you might be able to tackle. Hurry up, he sneered. But as Vervain hesitated, uncertain whether the general was serious, and come on out as soon as you've finished. Vervain advanced slowly across the floor. Even he could derive very little satisfaction from the prospect of killing a thorn rabbit half his size. In obedience to a contemptuous taunt, the small rabbit made no move whatsoever, either to retreat or to defend himself, but only stared from great eyes which, though troubled, were certainly not those of a beaten enemy or a victim. And before his gaze, Vervain stopped in uncertainty, and for long moments the two faced each other in the dim light. And then very quietly, but with no trace of fear, the strange rabbit said, I am sorry for you with all my heart. But you cannot blame us, for you came to kill us if you could. Blame you, answered Ravain. Blame you for what? For your death. Believe me, I am sorry for your death. Ravain in his time had encountered any number of prisoners who, before they died, had cursed or threatened him, not uncommonly with supernatural vengeance, much as Bigwig had cursed Woundwort in the storm. If such things had been liable to have had any effect on him, it would not have been, it would not have got him as head of the Auslafa. Indeed, for almost any utterance that a rabbit in this dreadful situation could find to make, Vervain was always ready with one or another of a stock of rejoinders. And now, as he continued to meet the eyes of this unaccountable enemy, the only one he had faced in all the long night's search for bloodshed, horror washed over him and he was filled with a sudden fear of his words, gentle as the falling of bitter snow in a land without refuge. The shadowy recesses of this strange burrow now seemed full of the whispering, malignant ghosts he recognized as the forgotten voices of rabbits gone to death months since in the ditches of Ephrafa. Leave me alone, cried Vervain. Let me go. Let me go. And stumbling and blundering, he found his way to the open run and dragged himself up it. At the top, he came upon Woundward, listening to one of Groundsel's diggers, who was trembling and wide-eyed. Ah, sir, said the youngster, they say there's a great chief rabbit in here bigger than a hare, and a strange animal they... Shut up, said Woundward. Follow me. Come on. He came out of the bank, blinking in the sunlight, and the rabbits, scattered about the grass, stared at him in horror, several wondering whether this really could be their general. His nose and one eyelid were gashed, his whole face was a mask of blood, and as he limped down the bank, his near foreleg trailed and he staggered sideways. He scrambled into the open grass and looked around him. Now, said Woundwort, this is the last thing we have to do, and it won't take long. Down below there's a kind of a wall, he stopped, but he could sense all around him reluctance and fear. He looked at Ragwort, who looked away instantly. Two other rabbits were already edging away through the grass and he called to them. What do you think you're doing? he asked. Uh, nothing, sir, replied one. We only thought that... And all of a sudden, Captain Campion dashed around the edge, of the edge of the beech trees, and from the open down beyond came a single high scream, and at the same moment two strange rabbits, running together, leapt the bank into the woods and disappeared down one of the block tunnels. Run! cried Campion, stamping. Run for your lives! and he himself raced through them and was gone over the down. Not knowing what he meant or where to run, the rabbits turned one way and another. Five of them bolted down the opened run and a few more into the woods, but almost before they had begun to scatter, 
Into their midst bounded a great black dog, snapping and biting, and chasing hither and thither like a fox loose in a chicken hut. And Woundward alone stood his ground. As the rest fled in all directions, he remained where he was, bristling, snarling, bloody fanged and bloody clawed. The dog, coming suddenly upon him face to face, recoiled for a moment, startled and confused. And then it sprang forward, and even as they ran, his Ausla could hear the general's raging cry, Come back, you fools! Dogs aren't dangerous! Come back here and fight!